So tell me, is it a question of out of sight means out of mind? Six weeks of war already between Armenians and Azerbaijanis over the enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh, and one week actually since I posted my number four on this topic, uh, where I had a discussion with Dr. Ibrahim Frehat, a scholar on alternative dispute resolution, about how this war impacts those principles of conflict resolution. In fact, since the 27th of uh, September, when the war started, it became quite clear to me rather rapidly that Azerbaijan is waging a war, not only to retake the five or seven regions or districts surrounding the enclave that are occupied Azeri territory, but that it was also aiming to retake the enclave itself that had seceded in 1992. But the question that I ask today, and I've done this throughout in one form or another throughout the previous three YouTube episodes that I've done on Nagorno-Karabakh, the question is, does it have the right to wage war, to retake this enclave, which is basically a de facto uh, state at the moment? After all, it has a defined territory, it has a settled population, and it has an ability to enter, to some limited extent, into international relations. But the key point is that it doesn't have uh, international recognition. So what are we witnessing uh, today? If we go back a couple of decades, there were four United Nations Security Council resolutions that confirmed that this territory should go back to Azerbaijan as its parent state, despite the major hiccups uh, regarding the way that the enclave was attached to Azerbaijan, even though it had a predominantly Armenian ethnic population. This, of course, I mentioned in a previous YouTube episode, happened during USSR times. In fact, some legal scholars and international relations scholars have referred to the Croatia situation in 1995 and the Sri Lanka uh, situation uh, with the Tamil homeland in 2009 to confirm that you cannot basically secede and then form your own uh, state. But then, can the seceded state or territory be retaken via a war or only via peaceful resolution? Is it a matter of legitimacy versus the use of force? And what about the humanitarian crisis it creates and the treaties and conventions abundant about the use of force? Today, for instance, the road through Lachin to Karabakh, which also leads to Shushi or Shusha uh, for the Azerbaijanis, has been closed on and off as the fighting continues nearby. If the road closes permanently, an irreversible humanitarian crisis would emerge in Karabakh. Environmentalists have also warned that Azerbaijan's use of white phosphorus munitions in the forest areas have also made them, or will make them, let me be generous, uninhabitable, both for people as well as for endangered animals. To date, 1,800 hectares of forest area have already been burnt. And a reminder here, that neither Azerbaijan nor Armenia are actually signatories of the 2008 Convention on Cluster Bombs. So why are incendiary munitions, why are cluster bombs, white phosphorus being used? Well, of course, to wreak havoc, to wreak damage. But they're also used in battlefields to make 
smoke screens to generate illumination, to mark targets and to burn, of course, bunkers and buildings. And according to the protocol three of the convention on uh, certain conventional weapons, which dates back to 1980, that was agreed upon in Geneva, the use of airdropped incendiary weapons against military objectives within a concentration of civilians is prohibited. In other words, said more basically, you cannot go around bombing civilians just before you because you want to target a, a military encampment or a military bunker. So what do analysts who know the region the Southern Caucasus say today. If I take Zaur Shiriev, who is the analyst for the South Caucasus at uh, Crisis Group International, he said, and I quote, we are further from a ceasefire in Nagorno-Karabakh today than we were two weeks ago when Russia, three weeks ago now, when Russia uh, brought the sides together. And Alicia Vartanian, who is another Southern Caucasus analyst uh, for Crisis Group International, said that Shushi, in essence, that Shushi will dominate the lower lands. And anybody who has control of Shushi will make Stepanakert, the capital of the enclave, vulnerable. In fact, if we go back a few decades in history, we might also remind ourselves that Armenians went to war with the Azeris in 1990s, partly because Stepanakert was being shelled from Shusha, which was largely in uh, Azeri military hands then. So today, talking about international law, talking about uh, humanitarian laws, talking about international relations, and also talking about the election of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States, will his presidency exercise any leverage on Turkey to stop egging on this conflict and frankly raising doubt about why it is egging on Azerbaijan to continue with the war? Well, there are two answers to that. First, the intentions of Turkey are unclear. Turkey has been all over the shop, Libya, Syria, Iraq, Eastern Mediterranean, and now the Southern uh, Caucasus. So I'm not exactly sure whether it is simply a question of populism, whether it's a question of uh, bolstering his own internal constituencies, whether it's a question of neo-Ottomanism, whatever it is, pan-nationalism, whatever it is, I don't know. I don't even know, and I'm beginning to get this uneasy feeling that this is not only a war to retrieve territory, but it's also a war targeting Armenians. And that opens up a whole Pandora's box of Armenian-Turkish historical relations going back to the 1915 genocide during World War I and even before that. So, but there is also another point. Biden will not become president until after the 20th of January. So by then, things will be quite different from where they are uh, today. Something needs to be done now. A ceasefire, a truce, negotiations. I come back to my earlier point that, yes, there might be legitimacy in retaking a seceded territory according to some precepts of international law, but there isn't the same kind of legitimacy for taking it via a war. And therefore, negotiations are the ultimate tool. And in a sense, what I would add is that in this context, both Armenia and Azerbaijan are signatories to the European Court of Human Rights their members of the European court. And so there must be some thought about whether 
the politicians and military leaders who are responsible for the random and untargeted shelling might one day see themselves being prosecuted in the European court. These are some thoughts that I share with you today. No more and no less. What I'm trying to basically say is, yes, there is a territory. Yes, it is and was majority dominated, populated by uh, ethnic Armenians. Yes, it was planted in uh, Azeri uh, territory. Yes, the war that ended in 1994 meant that something around 13% of the territory of Azerbaijan is now either uh, part of uh, Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh or also part of the surrounding uh, occupied territories. Yes, I do as add that there must be negotiations to try and find a solution. The OSCE Minsk group, other uh, powers that have a say in the matter, no, it cannot be done uh, through the use of war, particularly the use of banned munitions, loitering ammunition, uh, things like uh, cluster bombs and white phosphorus, because they are against the law and they make people subject to prosecution in the future. Because guess what? There are lots and lots of human rights monitors and NGOs that are monitoring this war. One day, whenever that might come in as an element in the larger uh, picture. But there is also the issue, and I raised this in numbers one, two, three, and I also discussed it with Dr. Ibrahim Frehat when we talked. That is self determination. How do you find a solution, a resolution to a conflict for a piece of land? that whatever the motivations, the world is full of boundaries that have been gerrymandered, that have been drawn in the sand, that have been flopped here and there. How do you manage to find a solution to a land that happens to be in a parent state, but is entirely or almost entirely populated by another ethnic uh, identity? And finally, I would conclude on saying there is a lot of bitterness, there is a lot of enmity, there is a lot of vindictiveness in this war because there is a lot of history. Armenians and Azeris do not see eye to eye. Armenians and Turks do not see eye to eye. Turks and Azerbaijanis consider themselves brothers. The, 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 the tensions are dangerous because they could spill over and lead everybody into greater trouble. But here again, there is a limit to how much you can push people. And I want to conclude rather wistfully by paraphrasing William Saroyan. And allow me to give myself poetic license here. A lot of the people who love William Saroyan and his writings will know what excerpt I'm referring to. William Saroyan said, there is no shame in being kindly and gentle. But there comes a time in one's life when killing without regret becomes a necessary means of survival. Now, to be honest with you, I hope we're not going to get to the stage where we say, well, he said it and it's happening on the ground, but I am worried. I'm worried because the international community is not too focused on this war in the Southern Caucasus. And if it spins out of control, it might get everybody in that neighborhood and further afield into much more trouble. So please, if you haven't visited my previous numbers, one, two, three, and four, the conversation with Dr. Frehat, do that before you listen to this number five, because put together, they are what I call food for thought and food for, dare I say it, hope. Take care.